The concept of iconicity is an ancient one. Its contemplation extends back to Platonic philosophy. Today, the concept is considered from within the intertwined fields of linguistics and semiotics. Irit Mir and Oksana Kachman describe iconicity as a relationship of resemblance between the form of a sign, the signifier, and its meaning, the signified. Necessarily, when a sign is iconic, there is a close correlation between its form and meaning. For example, a triangular road sign depicting a deer graphic warns drivers of the animal's possible presence in a certain area. The form and meaning of the sign are closely related. Not all signs are iconic, however. When the sign bears no resemblance to the signified, the sign is said to be based on convention, and thus the association between form and meaning is arbitrary. The sign of a currency, such as the dollar sign, is an example of an arbitrary sign. In both cases, the ontology of the sign is predicated on the relationship between form and meaning. A close relationship indicates iconicity, and a distinct relationship indicates arbitrariness, with both existing in degrees of intensity. A photograph of an apple, for instance, displays a higher degree of iconicity than a drawing of one. Naturally, mediums containing a photographic basis, such as cinema, are ontologically iconic. But cinema is also able to produce an alternative, ideological type of iconicity, the star icon. Here, the correlation between form and meaning is simultaneously patent, yet difficult to pass. This is because a human being, in all their complexity, becomes the signifier of a universal meaning, often an archetype of some ideal, that is abstract and mystical, and thus evades definition. The star becomes an icon by virtue of a wide array of attributes, such as their physiognomy, gesture, dress, and disposition, that are all enmeshed in their filmic, extra-filmic, and paratextual personas. Claudia Springer writes that this amalgamation provides a form around which fans' inchoate inner lives can cohere, something that they can adore through projection. Indeed, as an object, Marshall Fishwick notes, the pop icon inflames the same level of love and reverence as the more typical icons of religious significance, such as the Virgin Mary. There are many stars of the screen and sound, but very few are truly iconic. Of the 20th century, three individuals stand out. Marilyn Monroe, the sex icon, Elvis Presley, the rock and roll icon, and James Dean, the rebel icon. This video essay will take Dean as a case study to explore the concept of iconicity, as the brevity of his career and his untimely death by car crash has allowed a particularly potent distillation of those qualities he has come to iconize, namely disaffected youth, social estrangement, and the angst-driven desire to rebel against the generational divide. In his short life, Dean only made three feature films, East of Eden by Elia Kazan, Rebel Without a Cause by Nicholas Ray, and Giant by George Stevens with the latter two released posthumously, but this only catalyzed his legend. To anchor this conceptual exploration, I will consider the perplexing transparency and opacity of iconicity as it manifests ideologically and is fortified ontologically in and by cinema. As we shall see, the rebel icon is particularly difficult to delineate, especially as embodied by an actor as volatile as Dean. Further still, the elusiveness of the rebel icon is exacerbated by its apolitical ontology. Paradoxically, Dean's rebellious characters do not appear to uphold any overtly oppositional political views, an observation that Springer attributes to the censorious climate of the 50s. This wayward indifference is epitomized by Dean's most celebrated film, Rebel Without a Cause, 
The telling title blazoned in Technicolor Red in an ironic show of bravado across the opening shot, wherein Dean as Jim Stark lies intoxicated on the street as he tucks a toy monkey to bed with a piece of rubbish. The typography of the title is tilted and cartoonish as if to mock the plight of Stark and the generation he represents, whose rebellion largely stems from the internal failings of his familial unit, an overbearing mother and an emasculated father, and manifests in these moments of self-destructive behaviour. A comparable dynamic of familial frustration also occupies Dean's role in his stunning feature film debut, East of Eden. He plays the role of Cal Trask, the unfavoured son of two vying for the attention of their reticent father, a modern retelling of the biblical story of Cain and Abel. In this film, Dean similarly expresses his frustration with inadequate parental figures, this time a distant father and an absent brothel running mother, through unpredictable and often improvised behaviour such as fetal physical contortions, wild displays of showmanship and emotional outbursts. Richard Dyer succinctly summarises these core issues fueling the troubled psychology of Dean's first two feature film roles. In Rebel, he has too weak a father, in Eden, too charismatic a mother. But we can in fact observe this dynamic, the unruly externalisation of internal turmoil in all three of Dean's films. Springer notes that although Giant deviates from Dean's first two films of teenage angst by being an epic western drama, it manages to substitute authority figures for biological fathers. Giant spans several decades with Dean playing ranch hand turned oil tycoon Jet Rink opposite Rock Hudson who plays his boss turned business rival Jordan Benedict. As Rink, Dean leads an equally agonising life of self-destruction, largely in the form of alcoholism and social ineptness despite his eventual material success. Viscerally, Dean often oscillates through a kaleidoscope of emotions within a single film. Intrepid and charismatic quickly turns into sullen and taciturn, observable in the fairground brawl sequence of East of Eden in a brilliant animalism that imbues the rebel icon with an ineffable volatility. The affinity between Dean's rebellious fluidity and his amorphous characters is exactly what floats his image in the marketplace of universal reception, projection and reconstitution. In fact, the correlation between Dean and his characters cannot be stressed enough, for as David Halberstam observes, all three roles reveal an actor driven by his own pain and anguish. This is a salient dimension of Dean's iconicity, to which I will now turn. Transparency and opacity are two notions that are closely wedded in the ontology of the icon. Attention succinctly passed by David Gerald Orr. Icons are the most significant and ambivalently the most unintelligible of images. In other words, the icon is transparent in its mode of direct signification, but this transparency comes with an opportunity cost of any other divergent meaning, rendering the icon opaque in the fixation of its signification. This dilemma instills the star icon with a constitutional honesty by virtue of those features made transparent, but with this direct denotation arises an invasive inaccessibility. For instance, using the simplified example of the iconic deer road sign, we can see that it is only able to signify what it iconizes, that there are deer within the general proximity. Any meaning beyond this is cast aside. Such is the case with the star icon, whose very being is essentialized in signification in such a way that provides no other associative recourse. The paratex of a film play an important role in this essentialization. A term first coined by Gerard Jeanette in relation to literary works, paratex are the accompanying media that surround a text and therefore influence its reception by the public. This phenomenon is especially vital for films, which are often accompanied by a plethora of surrounding media that not only relates directly to the film itself, such as trailers, posters, interviews with cast and crew, reviews and so on, but also media that is indirectly related to, such as tabloids that divulge personal information about the life of stars outside the film. As such, paratext can reinforce any iconic signification that a star may have by facilitating a conference of transparency between the character inside a film, the actor beyond the film, and the star that walks the tightrope between the two. The relationship between these three personas is an important one to consider in the discussion of iconicity. This is because the degree to which these three faces are interwoven in a star's public image is often implicated in their ability to transition from mere fame and stardom to immortal enshrinement as an icon. The latter is a particularly porous tripartite persona, a thorough enmeshment of character, actor and star. 
Many commentators, such as Halberstam, have noted how indivisible Dean's life and art were. It goes without saying that Dean's death, by car accident no less, at the young age of 24 played an indelible role in the formation of his iconicity. Effectively, the tragic event imbued his posthumously released films with an element of prophecy. There is a curious parallel between prophecy and iconicity that accounts for the transparency of the latter. A prophecy is a foreshadowing of a future event, the prediction that something will happen in a certain way. When a prophecy comes true, there is a direct resemblance between the event that occurs and the initial prognosis. As such, a prophecy is a transparent mode of communication. This process also describes iconicity, wherein the iconic sign forewarns its signified meaning with a similar transparency. In this sense, the nature and prematurity of Dean's death, his extra-fictional persona, portended in a mode of iconic signification the ill-fated essence of his posthumous roles. This cinematic affirmation gave way to the iconicity of the tortured actor. Dean needed to die in actuality in order to be reborn in virtuality. Francois Truffaut's essay James Dean is Dead forms an important document of the historical film critic and viewer, one that captures the realisation of Dean's seemingly destined iconic becoming. The news, which we learned in Paris the next day, did not arouse much emotion at the time. A young actor, 24 years old, was dead. Six months have passed and two of his films have appeared, and now we realise what we have lost. It was his fate to die before his time, as have so many artists. Not even a month had elapsed since the tragic news broke when a morning audience gathered to watch Dean don that red Harrington jacket in Rebel Without a Course for the first time. Though the film's haunting scenes of bitter irony provide no consolation, it was as if they possessed a morbid knowing of what had just happened. Whereas in Giant we are left with the final image of Dean as Rink, aged artificially, the only way of seeing him so, attending a gala held in his own honour as a successful businessman to which he is physically present but on account of his intoxication cognitively absent. This unintentional swan song not only echoes Dean's iconic existence, embodied by Sally Lloyd and critical acclaim, but also his ignorance of the proliferation and celebration of this posthumous existence. The greatest cruelty is that although Dean plays doomed characters, they all survive despite the worst odds. Now, all that remains is his tormented image immortalised in a loop, a virtual corpse. But the correlation between life and art does not stop there. Like his characters, Dean had his own struggles within the familial unit. Many of Dean's biographers identify the early loss of his mother and a strange relationship with his father as the primary causes of his adult moodiness and recklessness. This observation can be extended to count for his particularly mercurial performances, a far cry from the still, stable and secure profile of the leading males of classical Hollywood, as perfectly epitomised by Dean's giant co-star, Rock Hudson. Dean readily taps a wellspring of emotional frustration sedimented by his early childhood traumas and ensuing adult shortcomings to deliver particularly cathartic performances. Whether this be a desperately improvised embrace of an unloving father as in East of Eden, an anguished outcry, you're tearing me apart, directed at the incompetent parents of Rebel Without a Cause, or the frenzied defiance fueled by striking oil hurled in the face of a former superior in Giant. Dean paradoxically graces the screen with a transparency of visceral and emotional rebellion that is all the while opaque in its ubiquity, such as the conundrum of the icon. The ontology of the screen performer fortifies this perplexity. Appropriately, in the world viewed, reflections on the ontology of film, Stanley Cavell dedicates a chapter to the deliberation of this ontological topic and how it relates to the cinema audience. In this chapter, Cavell distinguishes the screen performer from that of the theatre, identifying the inevitable. Movies allow the audience to be mechanically absent. Yet as Andre Bazan Avis, this does not mean that the screen is incapable of putting us in the presence of the actor. Although it is undeniable that the real actor is absent, Bazan writes that the screen relays their presence to us via the mirrors of the camera instead. Cavell recognises this perplexing presence and absence of cinema's ontology and how it uniquely implicates the screen performer when he writes, The actor's role is his subject for study, and there's no end to it. But the screen performer is essentially not an actor at all. He is the subject of study, and a study not his own. That is what the content of a photograph is, its subject. On a screen, the study is projected. On a stage, the actor is the projector. 
In cinema, unlike representational mediums such as painting, there is a collapse that occurs in the interval between the object of the film image itself and the subject it captures. Another form of transparency and opacity occurs here that speaks to the inherent ontological iconicity of cinema. The photographic basis of cinema extends beyond a mere resemblance or representation of reality. It presents this reality to us and is in this sense transparent. The opacity of the medium reveals itself through the mediation of the screen and camera, both of which facilitate the prescription of the viewer from the film world and establish a predetermined inaccessibility despite its transparent presentation. However, this ontological iconicity does not deem all screen performers iconic in the ideological sense described so far in this video essay, as knowledge of their extrafilmic reality often contends with their fictional yet pictorially iconic presence in films. Thus, when faced with a star like Dean, who displays a tightly wound conference between character, actor, and star, the ontological iconicity of cinema gives way to the calcification of their ideological iconicity and the subsequent essentialization of the screen performer. Patently, we have seen that the transparency and opacity of the star icon work in tandem at several levels. The implication for the screen performer is universal in reach, for as Cavell contends, occasionally the humanity behind the role would manifest itself and the result was a revelation not of a human individuality, but of an entire realm of humanity becoming visible. Ultimately, this twofold iconic fortification presents an ideal star image primed for eternal reconstitution and adoration.